Hi, it's Steve Hargadon. <laughs> I can't believe we're here. This is the closing keynote of the inaugural Global STEMX Education Conference. What fun it has been. Al Byers, welcome. Thank you. So glad it's you. We're all so tired. Yes. <laughs> but you're, you're, you're a joy to have at the finish. Uh, I have this big projected uh, screen on my wall with the schedule and the clock, and I'm just kind of shocked that we've gotten to it. Uh, but it's been a ton of fun, and now it's just delightful to have you here to close us out. Thanks so much to our conference sponsors and supporters. I'll say it one more time. They've been terrific. This is all the publicity they get for helping hold this free event, so please thank them for it. Those of you who are in our live audience, it's your final chance to tell us where you're participating from. Click on the map. To the left of the map, look for the star, and then click on the map. Feel free to shout out in the chat. Ross, we're glad you checked it out. You can continue to put notes in the chat about where you're listening from. Hey, we have an international audience. Nice to finish that way. Al, I'm going to turn the time over to you. I'm here to support you. If you want to go to Q&A at the end, I'll, I'm glad to gather questions and facilitate that. You can take it away. Thanks, Steve. I uh, appreciate the opportunity, and I, especially for you and Lucy Gray, who have, uh, in the pre-session chat, I hear win the Stamina Award for Around the Clock. So, uh, so congrats on that, and I do want to say a special thanks to HP, one of the major, of course, sponsors, and Jim Van Hyde, who invited NSTA to participate in this opportunity. So, so with that, uh, we have a nice intimate group, about 20 of us right now, that uh, at least on my time on the East Coast at 7 o'clock on Saturday night. So you all are the diehards that have attended all this conference that are taking Saturday night or, or depending on wherever you are in the world, uh, especially Japan, I think they're, but that's a whole day ahead, right? So, um, so thanks for joining me. And um, if you want to pause for questions, uh, Steve's here, and while I'm focused on the slides, if several people uh, have a question, Steve, please feel free to interrupt and say, Al, we've got a couple questions, or people can use the raised hand button right there uh, on the upper left-hand side of your screen. If I hear that little ding, I'll finish a thought and then uh, stop for a question if, it, if you use your audio. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Um, I think the topic that we're going to try to talk a little bit about, obviously with the context of STEM, is how the National Science Teachers Association uses a suite of tools and resources and opportunities to build an online learning community. Uh, my name is Al Byers. I've been in NSTA about 11 years. Uh, a little background about me, and, and prior to that, uh, I was at, at NASA as an aerospace education specialist, and prior to that, I was a sixth and eighth grade physical science teacher. I currently oversee our services division at NSTA, and that's conferences and online and blended professional learning, our learning communities, some summer academies and competitions and things of that nature. So let's go ahead and get started. I've got three potential goals for the talk. Uh, one is an overview of our STEM portal and the needs it addresses. So everything we do, obviously, from our association. I should, I should back up and say, those of you that might not know a little about NSTA, we're the National Science Teachers Association. We've been around about 60 years. Um, by certain standards, we are the world's largest association of science teachers, and our mission is to improve excellence and innovation in science teaching and learning for all. Uh, so we're not just about membership. So I'll talk about our e-learning portal. You do not need to be a member to access the resources that we'll highlight there or the integrated discussion in communities. I'll share a little bit of the strategies and some of the affordances. I'll show how we operationalize those strategies uh, and hopefully to build in a successful community. And there's, there's different ways to do that, so I'll highlight just what we're doing. And then I'll share a few research findings uh, about our efficacy and impact with our ongoing efforts related to STEM education. So let's go ahead and knock down bullet number one. Um, 
I think what you see here on the slide so often, as we all know, those in the ed tech arena, uh, we can look at any sort of technology and it's usually considered the next thing that's going to solve the problem, right? But if you're a true instructional system designer or an ed technology person, you know there's no panacea. I think too often, unfortunately, <laughs> those in administration, uh, we have formal partnerships with many districts and state departments of ed and universities, and, and they'll just, you could almost remove PLCs, uh, professional learning communities or communities of practice. You could almost put whatever you wanted in there, right, for education technology, and they say, oh, that's working. Give me several of them, right? So uh, I'm going to be transparent here. I'm going to shoot straight, and I'll talk about some of the challenges we've had if people are interested and in how we continue to iterate and evolve and try to improve. Um, our, our, our model and our portal. So one slide about the need is, is probably important. Within uh, the U.S. and within science education, um, there are 3.2 million teachers of science in the United States. There's about 1.6 million at the elementary level. And many times in their pre-service uh, life, before they enter in service, they may only take one or two classes in science. That's it. Yet, they don't, uh, when they get and become an in-service teacher full-time, um, they are still charged to teach science. And so even though they might not think of themselves as science teachers, they are teachers of science. Unfortunately, if they don't have much training or learning, and then all of a sudden they're thrust into that world, that's the, that's the largest number of teachers, elementary, 1.6 million. Research shows that if they don't feel comfortable or confident in the science subject they're charged to teach, they'll shy away from it spend little time on it, or at worst case, they can facilitate uh, misconceptions which are very hard to overturn. So at NSTA, we feel one of the biggest holes in the dike for us is teachers having a keen understanding of their, uh, of their science subject matter and how to teach it. Research shows that uh, the biggest effect size, the single most important variable to help student learning, and that's what we're about, uh, is for teachers to feel comfortable and confident not only in the science subject matter but in how to teach it itself. So when you talk about professional learning communities or professional development, we, we lump those two things together oftentimes. Um, there are three key areas that we try to focus on, whether it's formal learning or informal. And one is teachers' beliefs. I just alluded to that, that you have to get beyond just attitudes. Uh, beliefs are deeply seated, uh, and they're hard to change or resistant to change. So if, uh, if it's science education or STEM related, uh, you do need to help teachers feel more comfortable, especially I'll talk about the next generation science standards where we also include engineering practices. That's completely new to elementary te many teachers actually. Uh, and it's not much better at the middle school level as well. Uh, there's work by Ingersoll, it's not that old, that showed even at the middle school level, uh, many teachers are teaching in field but out, are asked to teach outside their field of science. So they might be certified or comfortable in life science or biology, and they're a person in the building, and if they need a section in earth and space science or physical science, that principal will say, well, just pick up a section of this as well. So they can be teaching in field, yet have to teach outside their field, their comfort field of which they're uh, certified. So again, there's that subject matter knowledge and pedagogical content knowledge. And then finally, there's work from the National Academies about how students learn. Uh, and there are some pedagogical strategies that facilitate how to teach challenging science and STEM phenomena. And that's coming to light. So those are, those are three uh, points you want to try to triangulate when you facilitate communities. So just recently in, uh, gosh, my goodness, what was it, in March or April of this year, it's very recent, uh, it's been 17 years in the United States, we came out with new uh, K-12 science education standards, and they're called the Next Generation Science Standards, and it's four states by states. So right here at the bottom, but what, re what preceded that, let me go ahead and get my cursor on here, was the framework for science education, again by the National Academies. And what they really talk about is a new vision for teaching. It's about the secret sauce, supposedly, and what we're all trying to facilitate now, is how do you intertwine three dimensions, both scientific and engineering practices, disciplinary core ideas, those are things like force in motion, nature of light, cell structure and function, and then there's cross-cutting concepts that cut across all those disciplines, uh, patterns, systems, and system modeling. So it's moving away from individual lessons for teachers, but at the unit level, 
to facilitate deeper conceptual understanding with real-world, authentic-based scenarios so you're not just memorizing facts for recall. So this is fairly new in the United States for our friend in Japan that's attending, and that, those are the types of topics that we facilitate within our online community. And STEM is a key part of that with engineering practices now being added. So, promising practice for teacher learning. From the research, and I'll get into our examples in just a minute, but research does say that it should be job embedded and it should be aligned to the local curriculum. It, it shouldn't be a, a bolt on, something completely outside of what teachers are supposed to work with anyway in their day to day work. That professional learning and professional development should be informed by student learning and student samples of work. It should be iterative, part of a local community of practice or a professional learning community. Expertise can be nationally accessed, but it's locally deployed within the school, within the district. That's where they meet within their teams. They look at their curriculum. They do lesson analysis. They try different pedagogical strategies that I just talked about, and they see how they can improve upon that across different units over time. Professional learning should be ongoing, year-long, not a one-shot, one-stop, spray-and-pray type of opportunity. Uh, research says it should be about 50 to 80 hours in duration across the entire year, not just one or two weeks during the summer. There's been some research by the Math Science Partnerships that show they had these great two-week experiences, but if that was it, when they did some follow-up observations and it wasn't tied locally, ongoing throughout the year, there's a fade effect and there's a fidelity of implementation about that learning or that practice. And then finally, this gets at the intrinsic motivation, that's Ryan and DC's self-determination theory things, or Daniel Pink's uh, Drive, a 2009 book that talks about this. You really need to cater to teachers' individual learning needs and preferences. There still are district mandates, right? We call that bounded autonomy. Districts have certain initiatives that our communities try to support, whether it's curriculum kits at the elementary level or potentially probeware, uh, digital probeware at the middle school level, or maybe physics first at ninth grade. We see many different types of initiatives within districts. So it's bounded what they're trying to work on, but our communities do try to still address teachers' individual needs within that. Um, probably one more note that's important to talk about. I would say Ryan and DC or Daniel Pink, they talk about if you allow adults, this is primarily with adult learning, but I think it works for kids as well. If you give them input, over in control over time and technique in, in the task itself or the team, who they want to do it with. That's called autonomy. That's, that's some user control. Then they're more inspired to work towards that effort. Um, they'll work towards increasing their competency towards mastery and through a community. When you bring those people together with similar learning goals and outcomes, um, there's a higher goal or a higher purpose that they're working towards greater than themselves or their individual need. And those are some of the drivers or the strategies that we uh, bring to play in our online community. So I couldn't have said any better than these two quotes from the National Education Technology Plan in 2010. A, a great shout out to the people there, Chris Didi at Harvard and others, as well as Karen Cater, who was the uh, director of the Office of Educational Technology at the time. And basically, one we've got to talk a little bit about blended learning. It, it melds the best of online and on-site, right? It provides immediacy, convenience, access, self-direction, collaboration with others they wouldn't have access to anyway. And then this bottom paragraph, it talks about that teachers, they teach how they're taught. And so that, that's very old research. But if we bring it forward and update it, what this paragraph says is, you know what, if you want to inculcate and, uh, and have teachers change their practice and use these cool types of systems in communities, kids are already doing it. But for the teachers, they need to also use it themselves uh, and experience it and do it firsthand. So again, a shout out to Steve. Uh, he's one of the leaders internationally, obviously, because of this conference about how to build these successful communities with his classroom 2.0 at name, a great example. So let me advance. Um, this is a quick screen snapshot. I won't go through each one of these, but there are a series of very current reports across a, a spectrum of area, both K-12 and adult, and even for educators. Uh, when you're done with this conference, I would jump right on over for October uh, to the U.S. Department of Education. They have a Connected Educators Month, um, and they have many reports over there and toolkits to help teachers get connected with other educators. Uh, there's all these are about blended learning and using online learning analytics. So we're, just, we're not at ST just about social communities. It's cool to have social. That, that's a piece of it. But we're about professional learning. And so uh, all our things work towards that end. Um, 
This report is probably one to highlight right here from the U.S. Department of Education as well. It was a meta. Thank you so much, Jim, for putting that URL up in the chat as well. I am glancing over there. And uh, Lucy said, hey, we're, we're part of that too. So great. So you guys are already connected, right? Um, so in this 2010 report, it was a great meta-analysis study. Uh, they ended up from an initial search of 1,000 studies. They bore down to 50. And of those, I think it was anywhere from 11 to 50 variables. There was a pretty small subset of things that seemed to show promise. And when they compared online learning alone to face-to-face -face learning alone to blended learning that combined online and on-site, they found significantly higher learning as in meta-analysis across those 50 studies for blended approaches at a moderate effect size compared to face-to-face -face or online alone. So that kind of drives our efforts at NSTA as well, as we partner with institutions of higher ed and districts, um, state departments of ed. They do face-to-face -face experiences already, and we kind of bridge in our community. So one more slide about blended learning. I'm looking over here at Terry Smith real quick. Now, also game-based learning. Oh, absolutely. Uh, this is not meant to be a, a comprehensive or exhaustive uh, support of uh, different types of ed technologies. You could take uh, remote labs, that's Kemi Jonah at Northwestern, or completely immersive labs, or uh, where they move to massive uh, multi-online player games. So I, I think all those types of technologies have different affordances. Um, people used to talk about Second Life a lot, of course, and I thought it was kind of funny, quick note about that, that sometimes people um, will try to recreate in, in a virtual environment verbatim what they could do uh, when you could actually take advantage of different affordances, affordances different types of uh, attributes in those unique environments. If you have 3D VRML and you're in an immersive environment, for learning anyway, right, not just for having fun, but we like when you can actually be in the eye of a hurricane. Or if you're trying to look at the molecular, molecular structure or understand uh, the nature of an atom or something like that, you can actually rotate it and fly around it. So to us, if we're an instructional designer, that's how we more see leveraging those types of attributes of those different types of media. Um, so outside of that, I'll keep going here. Blended learning, the best thing is when you try to integrate on-site learning with online learning, meaning you recognize what happens online when you're face-to-face -face and vice versa. You just don't bolt something on. Go here and do this, and it's separate. Click next or watch these videos by themselves. Um, my wife has taught for 20 years in, in, in many different counties, so I won't talk about any particular county, but I thought it was kind of funny that, that they said, we're doing blended learning, and she had to go watch some cool pedagogical videos of, of a certain practice, and after the video, there was three to five questions. And if she didn't get the questions right, she watched the video again, and they, they have a timer on those videos, and they have to watch a certain percentage of it till they can try to answer the multiple choice questions again. I, there's nothing wrong with that, but it wasn't tied back to the curriculum. Uh, the, local, the, local, the local district, they weren't talking with other educators like you guys are here tonight through discourse. They weren't sharing samples of student work as they tried that practice, so it wasn't localized. So there's a good idea, implemented poorly, might be a bad idea sometimes. So uh, I think it's how you use these types of technologies. And so that's what this bottom bullet talks about, and that's driven by this research at the bottom. I'm just going to keep going here. I won't spend a lot of time on these research studies. Uh, I did want to throw them in for the archive. And so people that are looking for effective ways to integrate online uh, and on-site learning, uh, these are some of those, these are some seminal articles for me through, through my graduate work that really seem to drive some of our thinking. And they talk about some cool strategies, uh, hands-on can be done at a distance, and usually the moderator is the number one thing that makes a difference sometimes, right? People that get elevated to that role are recognized, but this is a great article where they were very transparent about how not to moderate <laughs> from a punitive point of view. And so uh, in this instance, the mentor was actually the lowest rating. So this is a great non-example. Osten talked about blended PD and some challenges uh, there. So I won't, again, I won't spend all the time on these slides. Uh, Duvall, I think a cool thing here is that, you know, it's not one size fits all. They actually classified uh, and operationalized three different types of learners online in communities. And some people, they have a lot of time and they're focused on mastery. Others are very task-focused. They might, so that means they're juggling a lot, right? Um, they'll spend a little bit of time in a shorter period, but guess what? They, they still have very effective contributions. They still were, were learning and advancing. And then, of course, you have the procrastinator, and I think we've all got a little bit of that in us sometimes, right? 
uh, they, this group spent the least amount of time over the longest period, and they preferred the social discourse, right, where other people, I just got to get it done. They didn't care about as much interacting with others. So I thought it was, it, that was interesting. Lowe's talks about um, there are certain types of techniques, and Steve and Lucy are great at this, on how to um, extend discussions so that they go to a deeper level. And, and there are certain techniques that have been identified how to do that. We practice those in our community. So I'll keep moving for the sake of time here. Okay, and Jim's asked me a question. It says, does NSTA have social e-portfolios for teacher professional learning? Yes, Jim, we do. Uh, there's a tool, and I think I have a slide on it. So I'll get to that. We do, uh, outside of just integrated discussion and sharing resources, have a free tool where teachers can identify goals for their learning, put dates on that. Um, it's not just related to NSTA resources, and um, they can generate a PDF report from that as well, and they get reminders, red light, yellow light, green light, as those goals or dates approach, they can adjust them. So, great question. So, Anderson's equivalency of interaction. Great piece of theory here that says there's a lot of interaction between learner, learner, and learners and content, and learners and instructors, and really, the if you want to talk about formal learning, even online or face-to-face, -face, when you can have all those interactions, that, that's the richest, is it not? Um, but when you go to scale, this is a perfect example of a conference, or you take MOOCs or flipped classroom, the instructors don't, don't scale as much. So you can still have a ton of learning where you put the burden or the onus or the responsibility on learner-learner, or you have rich content where it engages that learner. So we... Uh, we think this theory is something to look at, and if you structure environments that have rich experiences here and rich experiences here, sometimes the, the lead uh, doesn't always have to be the point. You can still have very rich, uh, very rich engagement, engaging experiences there. And would love to have a link to that slide. So I have the citation here at the bottom, and I'm sure Terry Anderson would be very glad if you wanted to read, read more about it. I'll keep going. So let's get some of the good stuff. I gave you a little background there uh, that guides some of our strategies, and now let's show you how we operationalize that in the Learning Center. So the Learning Center, our mission is to improve and enhance the personal learning of teachers by providing a suite of tools, resources, and opportunities that support their long-term growth based on their unique learning needs and preferences, but within a professional learning community. So we've got about 11,000 resources there. There's a suite of tools. I'll highlight a couple of them. And we, it, and we have a lot of people that are posting all the time, but we also have some online advisors that are trained that can help facilitate that discussion and push it along. So users can create their, their own topics, of course, uh, but we feel that this is an important role for us as well. They, they, they're like concierge. They know the collection, like Steve and Lucy are for this conference. So we have about 24 of them that provide free live chat during 74 hours of peak usage time. Um, time is the, is the most precious, non-renewable resource that teachers have, right? Because that's our community. They have two minutes be, be, you know, between class and 20 minutes for lunch. And until you get to high school, you have to walk the students down to lunch. I remember I was a middle school teacher. Uh, they have after school bus duty in clubs. And if you're in science, you're setting up lab equipment and experiences for the next day. Time is, and lack thereof, is a real challenge. So if you're trying to get teachers in these communities um, that need to be effective, you need to be, you have one or only one or two shots. And when they come, you need to meet at their point of need and give them high quality content. Put them in touch with the right discussion or the group, uh, the discussion that's going on. There's a lot of them so that they might come back again. Otherwise, they're off to something else. So we think these advisors help. They're, they're, they're our concierge. And then we do, we are playing around with badges, uh, the MacArthur uh, Foundation uh, really sponsors this in the Department of Ed, and we've had a grant with NASA, and we, we're playing around with badges, and I'll talk a little bit about that and how they, they may help for some and be very important, especially when they're tied to personal profiles. So let's keep on going. Our Learning Center, this is a conceptual uh, map. There's different ways to get into our community. One, from an individual level, a teacher can take a personal self-assessment. I have another slide about that later. It identifies gaps or areas of need. It, there, it's, it's not compulsory. There's no grade given. It's a personal self-assessment. It suggests resources and opportunities, and they would show up over here. And then you could have DIY, you know, do it yourself, or just enough, just in time, just for me, self-directed study. You have these free advisors to help and email, content mentors. That's the just-in-time part. 
there is some more formal learning there online. There's about, uh, I think, eight universities that offer and uh, nonprofits great webinars on science. Um, gosh, I'm trying to think. Webinars, that's the American Museum of Natural History, and they have wonderful short courses there. And again, it's more formal. It costs money for those, of course, not to us, but to those institutions. So some people like that for graduate credit and they, when they matriculate for advanced degrees. And then we have our open community here. And so we try to put together people with similar interests and resources. There are some final assessments that can be taken when teachers want to document that learning for CEUs or for recertification, and that does feed into a database. And Jim, here's that teacher portfolio as well. So let me keep going. There's a lot of information I want to try to get through here. Um, and I, I'm occasionally glancing over at the chat, but it looks like, like Jim's helping everybody. Is that his TA on Coursera? Okay, I got it. Um, short answer is no to that, not yet. We um, have done one MOOC with MIT, it was on biology, and um, gosh, that was with Eric Lander uh, of, of international fame, actually, for the Human Genome Project. It was open to all. Uh, we actually, it just, we just launched it again. It's only been up maybe one or two days, I think, now in September. Uh, it's happening again, and they're the primary part. It's about subject matter knowledge, understanding for biology, but, but actually MIT came to NSDA. And they said, you know, that 35,000, we suspect some of them, we don't know who because it's open and we didn't collect a lot of demographic information, but we suspect some of them may be teachers. And so they came to us and we structured collections and discourse and, and a few live web seminars um, around the pedagogical component of biology. We have some resources like how to teach difficult biology concepts. And Paige Keeley, a past president, has some books and, and small chapters we made available for free. Uh, about known pre- or misconceptions in the life sciences. They're called formative probes that make student thinking visible. So we, we have a great relationship with uh, this. It's called the um, Broad Institute, and we're doing it again, and there's actually discussions going on. Uh, so that's the edX platform, you know, with others, but primarily Harvard and MIT initially, and that's where we are in the MOOC space. So to this slide right here, the Learning Center itself, there's about 11,000 digital resources there. And they are meta tagged by learning preference. So if you said, give me all your stuff in force in motion, you can sort by things that you can do yourself, self-directed. And there's these types of resources here. There's webinars that are free with NASA and, and others uh, that cover those similar topics. So you could, if you want to learn synchronously, you can attend those. We do tag things by books and articles, and they can be valuable. And then in-person experiences as well. So that's that helps operationalize not just the discipline or the grade level, but also how you want to learn. Here's um, one slide about, um, that kind of shows some, it's a back-end screen capture. I, I took it just earlier today, 9-21-2013. You don't have to be a member of NSTA. This portal has about 130,000 active users. The large majority are not members of NSTA. Here's a trend line over the last four years of our growth of uh, new users, which is nice. And then of those 11,000 resources, you have to add it to your personal library. And you can upload your own personal resources. Then you share those collections. So this is a nice stat that of the 11,000, those 132,000 have added those resources over a million times across their personal libraries. So that shows that we can always make things better. There's actually a, an RFP that's been being written right now to simplify the, the GUI for the next version of the Learning Center, but at least we're encouraged by these uh, past trends lines. So let's highlight a few tools in our community. Um, this is called a PD indexer. This is a personal self-assessment along different disciplinary core ideas like Earth, Sun, and Moon, and gravity and orbits and the solar system. We have them for Earth and space, life science, and below the screen here, physical science. And so you can get a record of your personal self-assessment. It's not graded. It's formative. There's no score um, given. And then you see resources after that. And you can add them to your personal plan. So that's a screen capture of the actual tool itself. And so then you're seeing right here something that's an older screen capture, but it's one I use to uh, typify how it works. So I took a personal self-assessment on cell division and differentiation, and I got five to ten correct, and it recommended resources I might want to consider. And I can look at um, the ones that are suggested, and I can also expand that list here. And then if I want, I can, I said, hmm, cell division and differentiation. This is a self-directed web module with embedded simulations and multiple choice questions, and I want to add that to my plan to help my growth. So if I click that button right there, 
um, I would go to a screen here. And this is our portfolio tool. And you can increase. No one would grow in all these areas, but I turned them all on so you can see the diversity or the range of support. So I'm going to grow on my subject matter knowledge or my pedagogy or my assessment skills, technology integration, leadership management, even something, whatever it is I want to name it. And then that resource is right here, cell division and differentiation, and I can define the evidence. Once I grow, I, what's my goal? I want to improve my understanding, my content knowledge in this area. Okay, here's the resource I'm going to use. When might I complete that? What might be the evidence that I could upload or point to? Uh, some artifacts and things like that or reflections. Um, and then when I'm done, over time, this is just the top level of the tool, you can generate reports to share with others. And many teachers for recertification have to do this anyway, every five years, for example. Then it can generate um, reports that they can share with their districts in the State Department of Ed. I will go back and say uh, to develop those items, if you're interested, there is a reference here that talks about um, the methodology there for validity and reliability. And, and many of us know that to get um, 20 good items, you have to have one to 200 items just to get the ones that are worth keeping, right? So there's an article that talks about the integrity of that personal self-assessment. Okay, every now and then I glance over the chat, and so it would be nice to get a group for <laughs> This is free. There's no fee for this. This is free. There are fee-based models with districts, but individuals, you don't have to be a member. All these tools I'm telling you are free, okay? Uh, so no cost there. All right, so my library, right? It's not just about uh, discussion. It's, it's tied to content as well. So you can share your own resources. This has been just three years. We added this component. Um, there's over 4,000 public collections. Users have uploaded over uh, 50,000 personal files. You get about two gigs of free space. And then you basically make your own collection. This one's on assessment. And these people are putting together resources. They can also include their own. And then they can share them with others. They can make them public or share them individually. So that's, that's kind of a simple tool. But that's part, that's part of the secret sauce of how to do an, exe uh, an exemplary community. OK, I'm going to highlight uh, just one or two resources. This one's called, again, Great <laughs> science objects. These are tied to disciplinary core ideas. Uh, they're about two hours in duration on particular science topics. Um, they have embedded interactive flash, or for the iBook, it would be uh, HTML5, but they're flash simulations. There are questions embedded uh, to help teachers discern their understanding as they interact with the narrative and with the simulations. And they have been correlated to the most recent uh, NGSS standards, just to disciplinary core ideas. Right? These are for teachers. These aren't meant to be units for them to implement with their students. Uh, they're meant to give refreshers to teachers in particular subject matter areas. There are 94 free science topics available right now. But I think we only have about three or four uh, different site packs to make. And each one has about three to five science objects. So we've got a lot of these done. It's been going on for about three to four years now. Way to go, Lucy. <laughs> Yay, Lucy. Um, OK, here's a screen capture of what that looks like. So you, you can expand these things. You have narrative. You have, I think these are iPads now for the icon. You have simulations and some questions. There's video. There's slideshow. There's simulations where you change variables. This one's from plate tectonics. As the seismic wave goes through plates, uh, you see the um, the, uh, it's audio, right? It's sound. <laughs> Trying to get on my science right here. Shock waves, and you're looking at the speed of velocity of that uh, sound wave as it goes through the different plates. And then there's the questions. The cool thing is you get some rich feedback about the questions. It's not just no, that's wrong. If we write a good distractor here, then we can write rich feedback. So for example, you might say, oh no, it looks like you're confusing speed and velocity. And velocity has a direction vector. So these things are. Uh, these seem very valuable, and people like them. Besides our journal articles, and there's about six to 8,000 journal articles, uh, the science objects, of which is only 94, they've been added like a half a million times of that million. These are one of the most popular resources that we have, and probably in part because of all these free simulations. And many people have simulations, but we have ours as well. Uh, we also do uh, web seminars. There's about 110. They're free during the school year. And they're with these people on the bottom. Uh, AAAS, NASA, NOAA, FDA, uh, our own NSTA press authors, and others. And so if you want to interact with other colleagues, as well as leading scientists and engineers that are taking the current science, again, 
um, I should say science slash STEM because it carries over especially when you talk to NASA and others. Um, you can do this every night. And the archives and podcasts are uh, available as well. So that's just another way to consume content. Okay, let's go to a section two here. I've got to watch my time, 7.30. Um, let's talk about some strategies and affordances that help build our professional learning community. So let me kind of get beyond the, the research. I showed you some of the top level stuff and some of the content. Now let's talk about how we bridge that into a community. So one of our strategies is when we build a community, we don't focus on the product at the center. We focus on the learning needs of the individual. And then we converge or triangulate high quality content. Of course, there is social discourse, and again, we have some moderation to help that. And then we have psycho-emotional roles for development or growth, and that's through badges and point and leaderboard gamification-like systems that help identify and recognize and provide attribution for people that are contributing in that community. Those three things together for us seem, seem to work well. Okay, every now and then I glance over at Peggy George. Are, are there scientists and experts on the site who are willing to be contacted via Skype on classroom calls? Um, what they do, I, I, I don't want to make, I want to make sure when I jump in like that, I'm cherry picking a, a comment that might have been related to another question <laughs> earlier in the chat. So, but what I'll say is those scientists do provide content information afterwards. There are many Ask a Scientist like websites. Uh, NASA, <laughs> thanks Peggy, NASA and others even have uh, projects that students can do in their own classroom and then through live Skype or video conferencing technologies, um, they will not talk to um, the students, but they will give feedback to local student uh, STEM-based projects. And that's really cool. So it's not kind of a talking head back, but students do some cool STEM stuff. And then they want to share that, and they want feedback from NASA. So the NASA puts the challenges out. The students do the project in the classroom. And then it's usually more than one NASA person uh, give feedback to the students. So there's a lot of cool stuff like that out there. Uh, and our web seminars provide those contact follow-up information. OK, so interaction opportunities. I think when you build communities, everyone, they start from a consumption point of view with the lurkers. And then over time, hopefully, they, they end up, they get excited and engaged. We know, as I said earlier, that you have to meet teachers at their point of need. They say, I see it a lot. I, uh, you know, the next day or the next week, they want to enhance their lessons. They're tied to a textbook or some support materials, and they want to they beef it up a little bit. And so they go online for something. And they say, hey, I'm teaching. I'm in Virginia. It's grade three rocks, you know, cemetery, English metamorphic. What do you have for me, NSDA? So content it is a big driver for us, not just social discourse. So we have to meet them at that point in need first. Uh, and then they talk about the strategies, how it's implemented. And they share samples of work and what worked or what didn't work. But you have to meet them at this point first. So they're takers, right? And these are kind of three stages of educators. There's early career. We have programs that focus on that. There's mid-career. And then there's experienced teachers, right? They can elevate themselves to coach or mentor-like roles. So we try to provide those opportunities. They can become moderators. They can become web seminar moderators or even the online advisors. They can be email content mentors. All these types of things or roles they can be elevated to when they're recognized in the community. So the mid-level, once you're consuming, then hopefully you contribute back. And then finally, at the highest end, they might be able to mentor or enlighten. I think it's really important that even early career teachers can serve in a mentor role, for example, where um, experienced teachers might have classroom management strategies down because they've been in that classroom, they know what works. Um, they're, they're, they're really strong there. Many times, sometimes early career teachers, they're very uh, adept with technology and some new techniques and tools. And they can share back with those that um, haven't had that experience that might have more years experience but not access to the tools. So everybody can play that role. All right, so here is a screen capture in our discussion forums. We have these online advisors, many are science method professors or master teachers. And here's our discussion forums. So here's where we integrate the community. Um, there are 12 discussion forums. I think this number is probably higher now, but there's probably 2,500 user-generated topics over the last three years when we integrated this piece. Um, there's over 20, probably 4,000 personal posts. Um, across these areas. We have one for STEM specifically and for next generation, but we also have these breakouts. So the challenge for us is not if they will come. <laughs> it's how do you help find 
these things wax and rain, right? I mean, imagine a page. This is the flipped classroom. This is a great current topic. These things are running for over a year, and there's X number of people in it. And so this person, this, by my definition, is one of the best examples of, uh, and, and I think Steve probably sees this more than I. He lives and breathes this stuff every day. But um, I can't search all these boards. But here they are co-creating knowledge. They pick the topic flip classroom. This person right here said, hey, here's the parent approval support consent forms that I send home. Uh, and they're sharing it with the community. And this person says, well, wait a minute. This is great, but I have a couple of curiosities. Look at how nice that is. They're, they're challenging a little bit this right here. But this is the way they word it. Um, and then this person says, hey, I put together a whole collection for the flipped classroom. And so here's 11 resources down here within a, one of those collections I talked about, like a bundle of resources. So they literally are generating new content within the forum. The challenge for us is when you have this many posts, that's where we're, thank goodness, we have people like Darren Cambridge at AIR uh, and others that are helping us learn how to manage these large communities through natural language processing and social networking analytics-like tools. They look like spider webs of sorts. They help us try to elevate and manage these posts such that we can um, get people to the content over time, and even similar content across multiple topics, right? So you can't search them all. So that's where we are in our forums right now, and there's several NSF grants that are, that are helping us do that. So a cool thing is right here, this badge or virtual business card. You see the thumbnail of the person. This helps against flaming. If you want to send a private message to them, but protect their email, because that there's confidentiality there, right? You can do that. If you want to learn more about them, you can click on their name and read a bio, see what badges they've earned. They select one badge that, that how they would like to be recognized in the community. This person applied for it and won a national competition to be a New Science Teacher Academy fellow, um, and they're proud of that. This person is a platinum advocator. That means that they have been writing critiques and reviews of collections, right? Uh, and that's a great professional development experience about what works and why you like it, and they're proud of that distinction. This person has taken, uh, I can't read the number, but a certain number of these self-directed web modules and passed the final assessment and earned these badges. So they, wanna, they, they choose that. There's something there with these virtual badges, uh, we feel. Okay, so if you clicked on that name on the prior screen, you'd see this. This person actually is a state science supervisor for Vermont. They learn about themselves. You can see all their posts. That is a way to help regulate the flaming and, and people that try to game the system. If they want to earn points for just making a post, if you can read all their posts and all they say is, yep, 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 that's great, that's great, that's great, wonderful, 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 to try to work up some sort of badge level, they're, they're, they'll quickly be caught. You can see all their public collections, all the reviews or resources, and if it's you're logged into your own page, you can see all your activity, all the posts you've made. You, there's different levels for our badges, and here's examples of these badges. Okay, I'm going to come up for a breath here. <laughs> 15 minutes, and I'm on, and I got to let's see, I got 20 slides left. I think we're doing okay, guys. So I think this one post really typifies the value of an online community. And the person talks about you've got to share ideas. You've got to learn from others. If you don't, you're isolating yourself. You're stunning your growth. These forms are very valuable. It's crucial to my growth. So I, it, we all know that because we're here, right? We're the proselytes. I think we need to talk to the, to the other uh, 36 that aren't online right now, right, and, and get them engaged in these communities. Give it a try. They'll like it, right? Right on, Lucy. She agrees. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how we do teacher recognition and affirmation. All right, so one strategy we do is we elevate the behavior that we want replicated. So on our home page, what we do is every week we elevate the top, uh, there's different types of badges. And some of the badges are meant to be maybe in the next version of the Learning Center, I think we might call them something like stamps from Kyle Peck out of Penn State. If you're a big badge person, a badge zealot, you know, you're really drinking the Kool-Aid there, and I agree with it. Uh, badges are meant to uh, recognize soft skills that go way beyond the transcript that, and learning that's captured beyond, uh, you know, just a grade on a course. Um, so that, and that's appropriate. You need to say, well, what does that badge represent? What are the skills and knowledges I've acquired? And it links back to show some portfolio and evidence of that. Um, 
we have some badges. Again, I might call them stands for the next version of Learning Center. They were more meant to be motivational, uh, to recognize participation in a community. So if you're creating collections and you're make, writing reviews, you're advocating, we don't control it. We hope they advocate positively, but they could be negative. Um, we elevate the top advocator. We have a badge called Disseminator. We want to encourage people to share resources. The badge has seven levels. If you just share resources, you can earn a Disseminator badge. Um, there is a, um, oh my gosh, I can remember my badges. We have 40 of them. So we've given her out over 50,000. But so there are some badges that are just to spur activity. So you aggregate resources, you disseminate resources. Commenter is another badge. If you're making posts, there's a badge with levels. And then there's the advocator. And then there's these badges that are only awarded that are tied to learning. OK, here's a question. Jim, I, I glance, happen to glance over, and you're right there now. Have any school districts used badges for professional advancement? Oh my goodness, Jim. Um, yes. The one badge is um, the SciPack badge. And remember I talked about those free science objects? We bundle those things together and make a 10-hour unit uh, on force and motion, nature of light, cell structure and function. So the little nuggets are for free, but we bundle them together and offer support and add a final assessment. Uh, it's almost like MOOCs. We have free access to the content, or OER, um, but just because you go through the content or you look at MIT's syllabus and go through the content, that doesn't mean that you, you've earned a degree or have any knowledge gain. So we have free access to the content, but then we bundle that together, and that's a, that has a fee to it. Um, and you can take a final assessment, and that can be used. It's used in various ways. Uh, you, you do get a badge. You get a grade. It ties into your transcript. Uh, we call it a PD record. It's not a transcript because we're not a university. And the, um, the districts ascribe the value. So we provide a mechanism. And different districts ascribe different value for that particular badge. Some, like Leanne Nickerson in Jefferson County, Louisville, Kentucky, they're a uh, union uh, state and district. And for every 10 hours of PD, they have to pay teachers $200. Uh, West Virginia. I think for every two packs, they had initiatives that were Marshall University awarded uh, some graduate credit after they passed several packs. Um, others award CEU. So it kind of varies. Uh, we just have the system. And then finally, I'm going to get back to the social stuff. If people are making collections, we elevate, you know how you, you crowdsource? We elevate the, the week's most highest viewed and most emailed collections. And so we put those things on the home page, and, and that's an incentive and, and recognizes people's effort in the community. We have leaderboards, okay? And so here's my badges. I was trying to recall them earlier. Commenter badges, aggregator badges, disseminator badges. I might call them stamps. Advocator badges. Then here's the one where you have to take a final assessment for the self-directed web module. Um, so I might put a hard line down here in terms of the differences. We found that leaderboards, and there's some research that talks about a 20% a effect size that it matters for people. But many people on a national leaderboard doesn't make much of a difference because they don't know who these people are. These are the alphas, the Uber users, right? But local leaderboards, we had um, uh, universities and districts come to us and say, can you give me a leaderboard just for my cohort, my district, my school, and my courses at a university level? And we made it for them. And guess what? That was unintended serendipitous. It was, it was a great outcome there. Um, if it's a class or a district, they do know everybody on here. And so then it becomes kind of fun. Let me see if I can. Um, here's an example of some of those web seminars for STEM, right? With NGSS, they're free. There's some of the highest attended. You guys can go look up and for the next ones that are coming up. There's, uh, here's one. See, this, this was an actual screen capture. I didn't make this up for tonight. And NASA was doing one here on engineering design. And not that long ago, right, of this year. A lot of universities use uh, the Learning Center to support their face-to-face -face efforts. Here's a list of a few. I'd love to give a, a great shout out to uh, Jackie uh, McDonald at Virginia Commonwealth University, and even Mono Tolliver and Paula Leach at Longwood University. Those are HP Catalyst, uh, Mono is, and she was also a keynote speaker for this conference. So I, they're also using the Learning Center to help uh, their local uh, math science partnership efforts there. That's right. Go Mono. Go Jim for sponsoring her as well. Um, I'm glad she had a great session. So here's one verbatim comment from a professor from the University of Texas. I, I, I kept the name anonymous, anonymous, but if you go here and you see all the testimonials, uh, she went on the record. And you can read her name and, and that sort of thing. But for this, this presentation, it was appropriate. Um, this is what she said. 
she was skeptical. She said, I didn't think these points of badges would mean anything. She said, I was so wrong. I simply put an announcement on Blackboard praising the folks over the weekend. I didn't even think about the fact that one man in the class had the top point. And then the women said, I don't care about gender. It could have been whatever. But they said, we can't let this guy get away with that. She says, I don't know what started. I don't know what the reason is. But that so it began. And one group affected the larger group. So I think there's something there. It, um, the thing to uh, avoid with this is um, an if-then contingency-based like system. And Daniel Pink talks about that in the book Drive, where you don't want to say, you have to do this. And if you do this, then you're going to get that. Because that sets up kind of a deleterious uh, effect. It's negative. It's not good. Um, it makes something that could be fun. And Steve would believe this. He, he's very open about it. You don't need to pay anybody. They're all going to do it. And I agree with that. We just have that to help facilitate some initial discussion. 24 doesn't support the thousands of posts and people that are on there, right? They just, they're there to, they're there, there to help us. But, um, but if you do if then, they kind of, it, it, we don't think that works. What, you shouldn't say you've got to do this to get this badge. What you do is you say, how would you like to learn? What's your area of interest? Let me diagnose my needs. Let me make my own personal plan based on the discipline, uh, the pedagogy, the grade level, and then as I go through that, as I contribute to the community, then I get these points, then these badges come, and then if after the fact you have administrators, we see this at the district level too, or the professors, then affirm and recognize the contribution It's catalytic, and that's what this, that's the difference, okay? Same system, how it's deployed, how the affordance is leveraged, makes all the difference. Okay, I, I can't stress that enough. So that's how you do it. You don't say you got to do this to get that. Uh, I know I'm being repetitive, but I'm, I, we're doing studies to try to affirm this quantitatively through research and all that good stuff, but I'm seeing it heuristically because we, we, we're in it every day, and that's how it works. Okay, so a lot of badges across different areas. We have badges for leadership, and we have some that are just attendance. Again, that, you know, some people... Seat time still matters for some, and that works towards recertification. So if you attend five web seminars and you write a reflection on how that's going to change your practice, you couple those things together, that can work for CEUs in many states. So that matters. Here's another quote from the district. The administrator said, a teacher sent the following information after receiving a note from NSTA. We automate these things. Congratulations. You're the top advocator. That means that they made a lot of collections, they went viral, their recommendations were well received, and here's what the person said. She was delighted. Look at what I got in my email. NSTA picked me. It's all because of you, the administrators, that I started this science journey. So when you start getting hundreds of these, you start to say, hmm, right? Something's going on there. So there is something about teaching as an isolated profession there, there's, there's not much time. They're in there doing good things in their classroom. Uh, and if they don't have that breakout time for a local community of practice, they're really an island unto themselves. And so there's research that talks about the perception of the administrator from the teacher's point of view makes such a big difference. So these types of point systems, leaderboards, badges can help automate processes where those district administrators are very busy. With, they, set, they, put, they set programs and put them out there, and they're all going on at the same time. So we can use these systems to then let administrators quickly chime in and say, hey, way to go. Nice job. Look at, what, look at these modules you passed. Look at that collection you shared that was well received. Um, it really makes a difference, OK? So that, again, it works, it works across different grade levels and different uh, deployment types, whether it's university or district. OK, seven minutes. So I'm going to speed up a little bit. We have different types of badges and levels. You can look at them all. Different types of points. Here's five pack badges. I passed one module, three modules, six modules. There's an Uber badge. I passed all the modules in physical science. And we weight them differently. More points there. So we're playing with these things, seeing how it works. OK, the last part, winding down. But does this stuff work out? Do you have any data other than your compelling stuff, <laughs> you know, your, what you think matters? I would say yes. Here's a screen capture from one particular district. Um, again, in our open community, that's one way it's used. But if it's part of a formal deployment with a district um, or a university, I think like nearly a third or a half of the Texas Regional Collaborators for Excellence in Science and Mathematics use the Learning Center in a blended fashion. Uh, they do a lot of face-to-face -face stuff, but they also as ascribe um, these self-directed modules and they use the portfolio tool. And so here you're seeing a pre and post. And this is the type of trend 
that you want to see. Um, and we're not trying to inflate this. It's just to save space. If you went down to a zero on the grid line here, right at the axis, this wouldn't look as high, so I don't want to look like I'm trying to inflate this. Um, again, to save space, so it would be smaller. But the thing to look at is that it incre increases, and it's usually by about 10%, and that's what you want for significant gains in learning, right? So here's different topic areas that many uh, PD things or teacher learning uh, efforts focus on. Okay, so there's a lot of publications. If you want to see what we're doing and how it's working, I'll give you a URL, and you can read these things that are done by Darren Cambridge and others uh, about how we're building our communities and, and how they're analyzing them and how they work and, and are they effective. Look at all these things. This, I, I really have to thank the people that are doing the work there. I, I just give access and help contribute, but they're doing the analysis for us. Um, we have them featured in several books as well, so there's plenty to read if you're interested. Um, there are, it's good, good timing here, we are winding down, so there have been four different studies of different, uh, different sizes, right? And here's a big one with NASA, over 300, um, with those self-directed web modules. And in all of them, across different grade levels, different subject matter areas, we have found significant gains in teacher learning and self-efficacy. One of the studies, um, this is a nice one with the Houston Independent School District, even found it's hard to design these studies, but uh, significantly higher gain scores in the treatment group that were using these types of systems. And then this last one was nice too, and they looked a lot at communities and badges and leaderboards and online courses across 13 districts, New York, Atlanta, Chicago. So that might be something. If you want to see that report and read more, check out that URL. Okay, four minutes. Um, there's some ongoing studies as well if you're interested. Again, a shout out to Susan Strauss at RAND, looking at blended learning across uh, different districts and different affordances. Uh, Dr. Goldenberg and Miriam Pasquale at EDC have just, just recently done some analyses uh, and summed up some things with an interview type of protocol. And then uh, the ongoing work there with Darren and Sherry and Sean Kellogg. Okay, I will tell you this. I'll say this just in case. Um, we're in a storm in Richmond, Virginia, where I am now, and my lights just went off. So if you hear some background things, uh, my printer turned back on, so I might lose my internet connection, but at least we got to the end of the presentation. There's a thunderstorm going on, so apologies there. Okay, so we've been featured in some other things. A cool thing here, we got an, as a notable platform to support the 100K and 10 effort. And I think there's an archive seminar as well that talks about this if you want some more data there. Um, and probably this is one of the things that we're, we're most proud of, where um, a subset, the computer science 10K effort community, they have a work plan about how to build their, their online community, and this was a nice quote from that report that said they're going to model their system um, after NSTA system with badges to help identify qualifications and expertise and things. So, so we're encouraged by uh, that shout out there. Okay, I wanted to try to, um, if Steve's still on, there's three minutes left. This is... You know, I'll try to be brave. I kind of remember, Steve, uh, where to turn on the uh, markup tool for everybody. If we give everybody access, and there's still 31 people hanging out. I can't believe that you guys stuck through the whole thing. Proud of you. Steve, could you give, if you're still on, uh, give them the ability to turn on the markup tool and pick, if you guys know how to do it, a tool will appear, and I believe it's the last, it'll, I think it's the last one. Um, if we do this, and so you can pick over here, you can mark, which of these? You can only pick one. So here's the question. What do you think would be the best blended learning model? This is an actual survey I gave to a state science supervisor district uh, association across the entire state. And I can share with you the percentages after you mark your own up. Um, but one would be if you provide an access to a repository of digital content. This is like the National Science Digital Library. Maybe the best blended model might be to extend face-to-face -face summer experiences with online discussion with other colleagues to discuss promising practices and strategy. Maybe your preferred method of the best blended PD model is to interact synchronously in real time with scientists and engineers and ed experts from like Department of Ed, NASA, NOAA, and the like. And then finally, I'm glad I'm seeing the people mark the, the stuff off. Um, I, I'm glad people are still talking about gaming. Um, Huge potential there, absolutely. And there's a report from the American Federation of Scientists that talked about the, um, 
validity and uptake of gaming for science as well. So there's a great report to talk about that. But um, And that's where we stole badges from. That's right. It came out of gaming to begin with, right? If people level up with different uh, levels of increasing complexity, right? Okay, and then number four, looks like we're getting, most people are, might be leaning that way. What about if teachers can diagnose their needs and long-term plans and connect them with resources and others, and then they can see recognition? Um, all right, not just slumber. Very good. I like this. Um, it shouldn't be just the one side of the summer. You guys listen to the research or believe that. Uh, it should be ongoing, tied to the curriculum throughout the school year, uh, informed by student data and work samples as you go through the year, uh, not just the one shot. So, but what I'll say, very interestingly, this, this uh, State Science Education Leadership Association, right in here, they, uh, there was 25% of them picked this. 25% uh, picked number two. Um, we're out of time. It's 8 o'clock, so I've got to close up. Uh, I think about 17% picked this and 31% picked this. I think the takeaway from this slide is that um, all of them, all of them work in concert. There is no one way. It's, again, it's getting the mix right across these different affordances based on unique needs that really can create the, the best learning community. Okay, so I'm going to skip that slide. And how about that for timing? 8 o'clock sharp. <laughs> There's the last slide. There's my contact information if you want to reach out. And, um, ah, Jim, yes, it was a trick question. It was, it was meant to make a point. Um, so thank you guys very much. Again, a, a special acknowledgement to Steve Hardigan. Steve, I know, I know you personally and you're a leader, and thanks for um, your expertise in this conference. And again, to Jim Van Ives for sponsoring this. Um, and thank you, Jim, for recognizing NSTA. So I'll uh, hang around for the chat for just a minute, but if we need to, to click the end button, that's up to Steve. I'll hang on and answer a couple chat questions if, if time permits. But I think we got a party after this or something. Uh, I'm supposed to go out with my wife, by the way. It's Saturday night, so I, I don't know how long I can join the online conference party. I need to get my 14-year-old uh, to uh, let my wife and I get a little one-on-one -on -one time. So anyway, Thanks, Al. thank you guys so much, and I'll uh, give it to Steve. Al, sure. you're under no obligation to go to the party. I think the family obligation trumps the closing party. The closing party is short, too. I'm just going to do some things. Thank you, Al, for closing this off here. Really appreciate it. I enjoyed that so much. And uh, thanks, everybody, for being here. What a great three days. I hope you've had fun. Bye. And, and uh, I'm going to put a link to the closing party in the chat for those who'd like to come.